Welcome to the Kill the Lion podcast. It's me, Cody Clark. We have a great show for you today. Kansas Bowling is here. She's a she's a wonderful filmmaker, a wonderful actress. Uh, we can't wait to talk to her. But first, if you like the show, two dollars per month. KillTheLionFilms.com. That's all we ask. Two dollars per month keeps the film studio afloat, keeps the podcast afloat. So uh, go over there, give us some money. And now, Kansas Bowling. All right, Kansas, good to have you on the show. Thank you for having me. So I really enjoyed your film, Cuddly Toys, and I really enjoyed your book, Cuddly Toys Companion, which, in my opinion, it's it's one of the best filmmaking books I've ever read. I'm going to recommend that sooner than I'm going to recommend like Sidney Lumet's book or whatever, because I think it's more practical for somebody putting something together themselves and going out there and knowing the the craziness involved and everything that can go wrong and go right and be magical and be crazy. Tell me about that book, because I, re- I really think you you captured uh, something with that. Oh, thank you so much. Um, I don't know. It's kind of hard to talk about the book because when I did the movie, you know, you have to edit it and watch it a million times. And like once I was done with the book, I had my friend like kind of just proofread it, I guess. And then I, I haven't really read it since I like barely remember what I said <laughs> but I don't know I just you know said said what happened that's awesome that it's um resonating and helpful and uh it's great whatever I said well I I can tell you as somebody who has read it that it's very good and uh I recommend it I think you should you should check it out sometime yeah and I I have a another book I I, I put out um with the same publisher Far West Press it's something that me and my sister made when we were little kids, actually. <laughs> it's called Pre-Written Letters for Your Convenience. We, we had this idea when we were little kids where we would have a, a book of all these pre-written letters. So if somebody, if you needed to write a letter, you would just look up the occasion and rip it out and send it to someone. But the joke is that the letters are all really specific. So we have a whole book of those that <laughs> Far West Press also put out that we made when we were like probably like 10 to 13. That sounds great. That sounds up my alley comedically and, and like something that I would I would want to use at some point just for fun. Yeah, I wonder if anyone's ever going to uh, use it like that. So anybody who wants to buy the uh, the filmmaking book and wants to, you know, get something else from this publisher as well. What's the publisher again? Far West Press. All right. Farwestpress.com. They're, they're both pretty cheap, right? Yeah, I think the Cuddly Toys book is like... Eleven dollars or something. Uh, my sister also has a poetry book. Oh no, yeah, it's Cuddly Toys. Sorry, I'm looking at the website right now. Cuddly Toys Companion is ten bucks, and uh, pre-written letters for your convenience is actually twenty dollars because it's color, but it's worth it. All right, so get those two and get uh get the other book is just buy every book on the site. Yeah, yeah. Just anything that's on the website, just add it to your cart and just check out. Yeah, good idea. So Cuddly Toys is a Mondo movie. And I think that's pretty admirable because I don't think that's a genre or subgenre that people are necessarily uh, resurrecting these days. But you did. What drew you to making a Mondo movie? I just thought it, it was um it, it was a kind of an interesting structure to tell the story. And of course, I've always loved Mondo movies. My favorite movie of all time is like kind of a Mondo movie. Well, yeah, it pretty much is uh, F for Fake, the Orson Welles movie. But the sort of pseudo educational style that that I, I pretty much ripped the ripped off the exact format from Faces of Death. It just seems like a an interesting way to tell what I wanted to tell. Yeah, I think it's a it's a great way to approach documentaries because there are a lot of documentaries out there that purport to be, you know, completely accurate and then you'll go online afterwards, you'll find out that they fudged and messed up a bunch of details but with a mondo movie they're kind of like winking outright at the start and they're kind of telling you that some of this stuff's going to be real some of this stuff's going to be fake just in the energy so it's a bit more honest than some documentaries in a certain way and also you know in general with fiction sometimes if you want to tell the truth the best way to tell it is through fiction it's the safest way legally and it's also just because everything that comes uh 
you know, into your life and, and rattles around in your brain becomes fiction anyway, in a sense. I think that's, I think they said that in one of the Todd Solon's movies, uh, storytelling or something. That's a, that's a great way to put it. Yeah. What are your thoughts on, on that and, and telling the truth through fiction, basically? I mean, you said it better than I could. I'm really bad at, at talking. I'll, I'll write it out. I'll, I'll message you it and you can just say it in your voice and then. No, no, no. <laughs> um, no, yeah. I, I mean, it, it is a true Mondo movie. There's, it's partially fiction, partially documentary, um, and then partially like uh, recreation. So, but even, even the fictional stuff, I mean, it's not stories that are too far-fetched or anything like it's stories that are that are happening all the time yeah i think that's an important distinction too yeah it's uh you know as as unbelievable it may be in how it's um presented in the film it's not far-fetched from real life in, in a certain sense yeah I, I mean there's like a teenage runaway there's a girl that overdoses there's like a catholic girl that feels guilty for losing her virginity yeah i mean it's just like things like that are happening all the time on a scale of like one to whatever how hard a movie was this to make because from reading the book it seems like it was it was an ordeal i mean this was very much a passion project and a lot of people throw the term around passion project for anything that somebody cares about but to me a passion project is something that it gets difficult and you keep going and you keep going and you you make it happen uh how hard was this to make um i mean it's always difficult especially when there's no money. <laughs> I mean, that's the most difficult part. Everything else I try to make very easy on myself, like very minimal crews and um, just working with cool people. But yeah, I mean, I don't have much to compare it to that's like easy because it's just how I make things. <laughs> Are you working on anything now? Yeah, I'm actually almost done with the next feature. Oh, great. Yeah. Was that one hard? Yeah, I this one is a crazy thing I I'm I've gotten myself into. It's it's actually 11 different true crime stories uh kind of told like anthology style all filmed in the actual spots where they happened. So it's all over the world. Wow. That's impressive. That's ambitious, especially for no money, yeah. Yeah, I've got myself into. I mean, we I have a little bit of money this time. Uh definitely not enough, but it's a it's especially difficult to do this one on on budgets because of all the travel and all the logistics. So I know you shoot on film pretty much primarily, um, and that brings its costs as well because you need to buy film and all that. Yeah, that's pretty much the the number one cost. Are you opposed to digital, or is it like just it? You just happen to like film better. Is it a is it a stance? Because I know for some directors it's a stance. Like Tarantino's, like I I only want to shoot film or and Nolan, etc. For me, for me, it is. I, I don't, I don't care what other people do. I, I, I but <laughs> I'm not, I'm not like one of those people. It's like, oh, uh, like you're an idiot if you shoot digital. But I much prefer the look of film. I don't. I just, I think the digital looks so cheap and bland. And I don't know when you shoot on film, each frame looks like a painting. And I just don't know why you want it, want it to look like that. <laughs> you wouldn't want it to look beautiful. So let's say somebody wants to start out and they're like, you know what, fuck this, I want to shoot on film. Uh, what should they look for as far as a film camera and what should they anticipate? Like, let's say tomorrow they're just going to be like, you know what, I'm making a film on film. You're right. Sorry, before I answer that, can you hear all that like wood creaking? No, not really. You don't? Okay, okay. And if I can, it would be eerie and it would be awesome. Okay, okay. Wood creaking is production values. We're, you know, we we need something here. Okay, just someone, someone walking around upstairs above me. I was going to tell them to stop walking around, but if, if you don't hear it, it's fine. Tell them we need more of it. We need, okay. we're going for like a horror vibe here. <laughs> okay. Um, sorry, so so the question, if, if someone wants to start shooting film or should they start, it, I guess it depends what you're doing. If you want to shoot a feature, I'd recommend shooting 16. If you just want to shoot, I don't know, stuff for yourself or like a music video or anything like that, Super 8 is a really good place to start. It would be difficult to do a feature on Super 8 just because it's, uh, I, I mean, I guess there's fancy Super 8 cameras that can sync sound, but they don't typically have a crystal sync. So it's more just like, and, and they, I don't think they, yeah, they typically don't shoot at 24 frames per second either. So it's kind of has like a, I think that's usually like 18 frames per second in Super 8. I could be wrong. And, you know, the, the 
one roll of Super 8 is like two minutes, 45 seconds. I My 16 millimeter camera fits 400 foot rolls, which is about 11 minutes a roll. It's, it's much uh, preferable to shoot features on. But yeah, I, I guess uh, Super 8 would be a great place to start. It's actually becoming increasingly difficult to get your hands on a good 16 millimeter camera. The, the camera I have now is like way shot up in price. I think it's like doubled. But yeah, if you get your hands on a good 16 camera, then uh, that's awesome. <laughs> so what kind of price are we talking? Because some people will put like four grand on like just a DSLR or some sort of mirrorless camera. Well, the, the camera I have now, it's, well, it's not it's not fully mine. I, I share it with, with a good friend of mine named Tim. But it's a it's an Aton LCR. For, it's from 1975. And I think probably now it might be worth like nine or ten thousand dollars. Yeah, that's not terrible because uh, like a lot of these guys, they'll they'll buy the four thousand camera, then they'll get like an external monitor, then they'll get all sorts of stuff, and by the, by the time they're done, it might be that much. Yeah, yeah, and it, th- that's not including the lens. But I, I pretty much primarily just shoot with one lens, and it, it, my lens was uh, like a thousand dollars. Yeah, that's not terrible. That's that's it is doable. I think if people want to do it, it can be done. It's it's it is something people can do. Yeah, yeah. Film is just very expensive too. But it it, it it like if you if you have some sort of a budget for a film, I don't know. It, it depends. I guess it depends how big your budget is. It should only eat up like a portion of it. I think you can pretty much do a feature and spend like twenty grand on film. I feel like if somebody's making their first movie, basically just, you know, buy the equipment and then do everything else for free or as free as possible. Yeah. You know, let the camera be your 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 budget and, and the film be your budget, et cetera. I'm drawn to the lenses in particular because I, I shoot digital. I've, I've never shot film. Not that I'm opposed to it. It's just never been something I've done. But I do like the old lenses. I do. I'll use like a C mount lens on like a newer camera, or I'll use like lenses from the seventies, old Nikkor lenses and stuff. And I, I think a great piece of glass really goes a long way. And I, I get frustrated when people will buy, you know, the top of the line camera, and then they'll just get like the piece of crap plastic lens that's overpriced that goes along with it, and the autofocus works perfectly on it. It's like fuck you, just get like the manual focus lens. That's like the gold standard for the past like 40, 50 years and do something in that regard. Like it's you're going to get a more interesting look. I'm always trying to get as much out of digital as I possibly can. Yeah, the lens is everything. I My friend Jay Burleson recently, he just released a double feature. There's one called Third Saturday in October and then the other one's called Third Saturday in October Part 5. And I, I'm, I'm in Part 5, but Part 1 he made, it's it set in the 70s and he actually got like a 70s lens that he put on the digital camera that they're shooting with and it looks amazing like it it really looks like it was shot on 16 it's really crazy yeah it can be so beautiful and it can be as simple as just you know really straight lines uh, a lot of the time because people i think people are used to a lot of like distortion because of um iphones and stuff like if you find a lens with with not much distortion as far as like the lines and you plop it onto a newer camera, people are going to lose their minds. That's what's happened when I've made films is people people always ask whenever I make a new movie, like, what'd you shoot that on? And I'm like, it's the same one I've been always using. Like it's I've just carried across the same lens. I just put it on the new camera that I get or whatever. But it's always the same lens because a a good lens can last you like an entire lifetime. It's just it's metal and glass and and a little bit of rubber. And and it's just a great piece of glass, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I I mean, I've I shot all of Cuddly Toys on just one zoom lens just because I mean, I I really wish I had a wide lens, but um, I mean, it worked. So, yeah, I, uh, I I tend to shoot with one lens per an entire film. Maybe if there's like some shot where I really need something far away, I'll, I'll, I have a longer lens that I'll use for that, but it's of the same family. It's of the same like Nikkor family. I think it's like a 135 millimeter, um, that I, I'll, I'll just use. And it's the same aperture, same everything. Um, and you know, I'll, I, but basically I like doing one lens movies because I, it gets me to think about things in a different way. It, it locks me into, um, 
just a limitation because I feel like limitation is kind of key, right? You know, if you have too much freedom, you have too much freedom of choice and you could do any number of things uh, for a particular shot. But if you got the one lens, you you have to use it the way that it needs to be used for sure. So I want to talk about limitation as far as budget, because I do think that, you know, low budget, it's very difficult. It's it's hard to make a movie for no money. It It sucks to not be able to throw money at problems to make them go away. But there there can be something really beautiful in that you make movies you wouldn't otherwise. I always think about like my cheapest projects. They they wouldn't exist if I had a budget. Like I just wouldn't even make them. Yeah. But because I had no money, I made so and so project and the people that love that film, they don't think about how much it costs when they watch it. They just think about how much they love it and how much they're enjoying what they're seeing. So I think it frees your mind a little bit to think about things in a different way. Um, have you have you kind of relished the the low budget uh, approach to filmmaking and been grateful for it in certain ways? Yeah, I mean, uh, I definitely wish I'd have more money to like pay people and things like that. But uh, otherwise, I don't think I would do much different because you know, uh, I mean, there hasn't really been a time where I've wanted to film something and I haven't been able to because of a money issue. Like, I feel like I've pretty much always gotten what i need to actually this is a fun funny story recently i was filming in massachusetts for my new movie and i really needed two cars that were like 1982 or older so they can match this um the story and if i was doing a, a movie with a big budget i could have gone through the proper channels and rented them from certain people or um people that would out cars or whatever but i I was able to like, I got these people to agree to let me borrow theirs for the shoot. I was going to pay them like a hundred dollars or something, but it's the day of, and the person backs out. They were like, eh, like, sorry, we're busy tonight. And I was like, oh my God, like the scene's not going to work without the cars. Cause it was like, she needed to be pulled over by this guy pretending to be a cop and then kidnapped. And then, so I was just like freaking out. And I, I just like, I was just asking everyone i put it all over the internet i had all these other people asking like i was asking strangers i was doing all of this and finally i, I got a hold of this classic car club in rhode island <laughs> and they were like well we'll let you have our cars and they were all muscle cars but i was like whatever at this point it doesn't even matter like it doesn't make sense the characters are driving muscle cars but whatever it's, it's like at least historically accurate and um so we drove like two and a half hours to rhode island to finish the scene and we get there and there's just this row of cars like everyone in this neighborhood came out with their old cars and they were like take your pick but then like five minutes later these other people pulled up and the the people that pulled up later were the people that i was actually originally talking to and the people that were there that i had first met were pretending to be those people because they wanted to be in the movie <laughs> and so they were like 15 cars that showed up because they all really wanted to be in the movie and then i got to take my pick and i picked out two cars um and then we were just like all hanging out with these like rhode island people with their classic cars and it was it was hilarious so you know stuff like that would have happened if um i've just rented the cars properly but um you know it, it, it was um very scary that I thought it wasn't going to work out at first, but you know, I'm pretty, I don't, I don't think there's been a case where I haven't figured something out like that. That's so great. That's such a magical moment that, you know, in retrospect, you wouldn't trade for the world. Like that, that person falling through and, and all that, that, that led to such a, like a dreamlike almost uh encounter with uh, all these cars showing up. Yeah. It was so funny. And a million other stories like that, just like, I don't know, just especially if you're not shooting in like a city, I don't know, pe- people just sort of want to come together to help out with, with whatever you're filming. It's always fun. Yeah, that's that's one of my favorite parts of making movies is, you know, it's it's great to see your vision come alive on screen and all that. And it's great to, you know, bond with the people you're making movies with along the way. But I just love those serendipitous uh, occurrences that happen along the way that just are almost as magical as anything you're trying to present on screen, if not more so. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I like when the stars kind of align for uh, a bunch of kids just trying to make a piece of art. It's 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 just a lovely, lovely thing for sure. Yeah. So talk to me about Psycho Ape, because I know you're making Psycho Ape 2 soon. 
uh, with Addison and Greg. What are you anticipating with Psycho Ape 2? Uh, do, do you know much of the script so far? Uh, what, what, are you, uh, what are you feeling? Me and, and Greg and uh, Lo Espinosa, who's like, I think she's going to be in it, but she's doing effects and stuff. Uh, we, we all came up with a bunch of ideas, but I don't know if Greg's going to use any of them. I, we had this idea about uh, Psycho Ape moving to Vegas and starting a... Um, like a Vegas show. And then like I moved to Vegas and I start dating Flava Flav. I like that. <laughs> but, um, and then I like see like the show on accident or something. I, I can't really remember, but I don't know. I think that sounds great. I like, I like a Vegas ape. I like, uh, I like that vibe. I want to see that. So it's been pretty exciting. I mean, you guys have raised a ton of money for the film. You guys have raised more than you were even looking for. Have you been kind of like taken aback by the popularity of the film? Uh, no, it's awesome. Uh, I, I think they're just really good at getting it out there, and um, yeah, it's, it's 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 cool. A lot of random people I've met have like even seen it. It's kind of bizarre. Yeah, it's one where like you know I I'll hear people talking about it, or people will be I'll see people talking about it, and then I'll I'll get to you know mention to Greg like hey like. You know, it, it, when you when you hear stuff in the wild, it's just it's you really realize how much a film has gotten out there for sure. Yeah. So when can we expect uh, and we meaning all the listeners at home, when can they see Cuddly Toys proper? It, it, I know you're doing uh, some kind of four walling. You're, you're bringing it to different theaters. Uh, are there upcoming dates where they can check it out? Yeah, um, it's playing every weekend this month in New York. This is July 2023 uh, at Film Noir in Greenpoint, Brooklyn. And then it's playing in Los Angeles at the Los Feliz 3, July 14th. And then it's playing a bunch of dates at the end of July, this July in Chicago, Alamo Draft House, the Davis Theater, and Facets. And then August, it's playing at a bunch of places Memphis, New Orleans, St. Louis, uh, Philly. Yeah, well, lots, of, lots of places. That's great. And is there any plan going forward as far as like a physical media version or a streaming version? Uh, yeah, I don't know when it'll be streaming, and but we have we do have a really cool Blu-ray release coming out. I I can't say with who yet, I guess, but um, some someone very very cool. That sounds great. All right, so Kansas. Mm-hmm. If if you've heard the show before, I don't know if you've have if you have, but if you've heard the show before, we have two segments we do before we go. Okay. First segment's brand new, so you might not even know this exists. This is uh I've only been doing it in the last couple of episodes. I, I prescribe a movie for the guest. Basically, I, I used to work at video stores for a very long time, uh, in my teens into my early twenties. I got really good at like picking a movie for somebody. So I want to pick a movie for you. What are you in the mood for to watch right now? Um, oh God, I don't know. A horror movie. A horror movie. We we can we can dial it in very specifically. Give me give me an era. Give me uh give me whatever. A uh, giallo. Really? Okay. All right. I'm gonna go with. Okay, so I'm gonna recommend this, even though I don't fully like the movie, but there are aspects that I think are really good. You might have seen this one already. It might be one that you uh, have seen. Uh, I'm just I'm googling it just to make sure I got the uh, the title right. One second. I wouldn't want to send you off looking for a movie that you're like, hey, that movie doesn't exist because I got the title wrong or something. Okay, I don't know if you've seen this. You might have seen this. Have you seen the 1987 film Delirium? Yeah. All right. Well, okay. <laughs> It's Lamberto Bava, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, with the the eyeball, the eyeball face. I yeah, I don't fully like the movie, but I love that aspect of it for sure. The eyeball face. Yeah, the, the eyeball face part. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah that's the best part. <laughs> that that's a great part. Uh, I haven't seen. It, I just I kind of remember. Is it like the like the music really bad? It's pretty bad. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's that's kind of like. I just yeah, I remember there were there were visual aspects of it that were really cool, but just kind of the, the style was a bit off. It was like you know, late 80s. Meh. Yeah, I love the lady, though, Serena Grandi. She's she's been in a bunch of Italian movies. She's she's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I love Lamberto Bobbitt, though, too. He's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Look, this is the first time this has happened, by the way, that, that somebody has seen the movie that I recommended. 
Oh, really? We're going to, yeah, I know. We're going to go further though. We're going to, we're going to find something specific for you. Giallo isn't really my, my territory. I will admit, but I'm going to go, I'm going to go adjacent. Okay. I'm not going to go specific. I'm going to go, if you like Giallo, you might like blah, blah, blah. Okay. I'm going to go with something that this is a movie that has come up before that I think is, is criminally underrated. And I know you probably haven't seen. And in my opinion, it is kind of Giallo adjacent because it feels like it's going to turn into a Giallo film. It constantly feels like it's going to make that turn. I'm not going to say if it does or if it doesn't, but you get that sense as you're watching it because it's so tense and the, the relationship dynamics just kind of are in that territory. This is a newer film. It's called Backstage. It's from 2005, uh, directed by Emmanuel Berko. Have you seen that film? No. Okay, good. I really think you're going to like that movie, especially if you're anticipating that it, this could be a horror. And I don't know if it's going to be a horror, but it could be a horror. It's about this uh, groupie who loves this pop singer and uh, this, this French pop singer. And they, they show up at her house and they they show up with the pop singer and they're going to air it on TV that this girl is going to freak out and be so happy and just be uh, like so ecstatic that this pop singer is, is at her house that she loves. And they show up at the girl's house and her reaction is just entirely not what they're looking for. Like, it's so sad and it's so like, oh, fuck, like we can't even air this because it's just like. This girl is just not giving us anything we can use. And that's where the movie starts. And I won't tell you where it goes from there, but that's that's your setup. And to me, it's one of the best movies made in the last like 30 years easily. And nobody's fucking seen it. It's so good. Yeah, it sounds good. All right. So that's your that's your movie recommendation. Uh, I hope you will you will actually watch the movie because those that do tend to find that they they like the movies that I I recommend in this segment. Okay. All right. Next segment. If you've heard the show before, we do this every episode. Stupid questions. Are you ready to be asked some stupid questions? Yeah. I, I like this stuff better than talking about my movies. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This is, uh, we could do this all day. Okay. <laughs> First stupid question. Do you like The Wizard of Oz? Yeah, of course. My name's Kansas. See, I, I don't know. You might like resent it or something. <laughs> no, it I, might be competition. I, it's, it's, I mean, it's a perfect movie. It is. It's so influential too. Like I, I watched it for the first time in a bazillion years, like maybe a couple months ago, and I realized, like, oh, this is just every movie henceforth. Like you, you find uh, like everything in it. Yeah, I think I think John Waters said that he's like every movie is basically just trying to remake Wizard of Oz. Yeah, it's. It, I think it's an immaculate film, and I, I always get disturbed by the part with like the pollen because I know they're basically raining asbestos on them. Yeah. <laughs> Crazy movie. All right, second stupid question. Are you a good bowler? Not really. No? Yeah, I, I think last time I played bowling, I think I went around Christmas with my boyfriend Don and my mom and her boyfriend. And I think I think like the first game I got like I was like third out of four people. So That's not bad. You know, yeah. All right. So next stupid question. Have you have you ever done candle pin bowling? No. Do you know what it is? No. Okay, so this is a New England thing. This is when I used to go visit my grandparents in like Cape Cod or whatever. This is this is the alternate universe I would be thrust in, which is candle pin bowling, which is it's like bowling, but everything's fucking different and weird. You got these long sticks that you have to hit and you have a smaller ball and you feel like you woke up in like Bizarro World. <laughs> if you ever want to like trip without drugs, just try candle pin bowling. Okay, that sounds cool. Yeah, you ha- you got to go to like Massachusetts, Connecticut, and you'll think you're walking into a normal bowling alley, and then you you look at the the lanes and you just see these these long sticks, and there's a bunch of them. And oh, so it's not. I was picturing something like outdoors. There's like candle bowling places you go to. Actual full on bowling alleys, but you walk in and it's crazy time. That sounds awesome. I want to do that. Yeah, I think you'd like candle pin bowling. Okay. Allegedly, it's harder than actual bowling, which is weird because it's not you know, a known sport, but yeah. Candle pin bowling. Okay. All right. Next stupid question. Have you ever done duck pin bowling? No. That's another bowling variant. I you, I, I think I've only done normal bowling. So. Okay. <laughs> duck pin bowling, they're, they're shorter uh, pins 
they're fatter. They kind of look like ducks that are just kind of sitting there in the distance. And uh, you you use a smaller ball, kind of like candle pin. Um, but yeah, that's duck pin bowling. A bit harder to find. Uh, still, again, kind of New Englandy uh, thing. But candle pin more popular around there. But there is duck pin bowling. You can try that at some point in your life. Okay, I will. All right. I promise. All right. Well, Kansas, thank you for being on the episode, by the way. This is this has been a delight. Uh, I really enjoy your work. Thank you so much. I'm looking forward to the new one. Um, we, Me and and Craig and our friends Hunter and Darby, we watched one of your movies when, when we were filming Bad Brain. Oh, nice. We watched No Shark. No shark is a it, that's the one the Japanese love. That's a classic. Really, I I, thought I I found it very fascinating. It is it is a very strange film, and for some reason the Japanese have embraced it because I think they love shark movies, and they were waiting for something kind of existential and uh, genre breaking because it's the shark movie without sharks, and it's been very popular there. Yeah, that's, I, I kept waiting for the shark, and then I was like, oh my god, it's called No Shark. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. You should watch more of my movies. None of them are shot on film, but they they are kind of visually interesting. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I I will watch more of them for sure. All right, Kansas, can't wait for the next film. What what else do you want to leave the the listeners with? What what do you want to tell them? Whenever whenever you can, whether it's uh, streaming or in a theater, see cuddly toys. Yes, yes. And I, I agree as well. I love Cuddly Toys. I think it's it's so unique and, and so off the wall in all the best ways. And I had such a great time uh, seeing it in a proper theater. So I would recommend people seeing it in a proper theater for sure. Thank you. Thank you. All righty, Kansas. Anytime, come back, talk your, your heart's content. That was fun. And uh, thank you for being on the show. Okay, cool. Um, thank you. Thank you. Talk later. Talk later. Thank you all for listening. And if you enjoyed the show, killthelinefilms.com, $2 per month. That's all we ask. It keeps the film studio float. It keeps the podcasts coming out. So uh, show your appreciation there. Thank you for listening. See you soon.